if we can have our provocateurs as well as our speaker on screen. Good morning, everyone. How are you? It's morning where I am. I hope you have had a good morning or you are having a good morning. Um, it's a pleasure morning. to see you all. Uh, I'm very excited for this. Marty, I'm super excited for your conversation. So if we can have seven minutes on the screen, please. Each uh, talk is going to be seven minutes long. Each talk back with our provocateurs is going to be seven minutes. So it's going to be 14 minutes of mind-blowing science and questions and curiosity. So without further ado, Marty, your seven minutes starts right now. Wonderful. Thank you, Ahmed, and hello to everybody. I want to start by talking about the work of the Committee on Human Rights, which I chair at the National Academy. We advocate for scientists, engineers, and health professionals anywhere in the world who've suffered major abuses of their human rights, meaning unlawful arrests, arbitrary detention, sometimes even attacks. We also provide assistance to these individuals and their families, establish resources on information about science and human rights, and convene events to raise awareness of issues at the intersection of science and human rights. And I invite all of our listeners to go to our website, nationalacademies.org slash human rights, for more information about these activities and many other resources. And I wanna particularly draw your attention uh, to a photo exhibit that we've put together uh, as part of this Nobel Prize Summit entitled Advancing Rights and Freedoms, Science, Human Dignity, and the Nobel Prize. This highlights various ways in which Nobel Prize winning scientists have worked to protect and promote human rights. Now, some of the people we work on behalf of uh, have been arrested, incarcerated, or harassed for their professional work. This includes Yevgeny Batishko, a Russian geologist who was arrested and convicted without credible evidence after documenting the illegal construction in the Western Caucasus National Park connected with the preparation for the 2014 Sochi Olympics. And there have been several engineers, scientists, and other educators in Iran who were arrested and imprisoned simply because they taught college courses in people's living rooms to buy high students who had been prevented from attending university. And finally, as my final example, those are medical professionals in many countries, unfortunately, right. even including the United States, who were attacked, and in some cases arrested by police or military authorities for yeah, giving I medical assistance um, to injured me. protesters. Unfortunately, just doing one's job can put one at risk. We also advocate for scientists, engineers, and health professionals who've suffered human rights abuses because they've simply spoken out against injustices. These include Professor Muntasser Ibrahim, a geneticist who was arrested for his efforts to promote peaceful a peaceful resolution to conflict in Sudan. Uh, the entire governing board of the Turkish Medical Association who were arrested after issuing a statement opposing the incursion of the Turkish government into Syria. And Dr. Dennis McQuaggy from the Democratic Republic of the Congo, who was harassed and the subject of an assassination attempt for his work to end the use of rape and other forms of sexual violence as tools of war work that actually led to his sharing the 2018 Nobel Prize in Peace. I'd like to talk actually now a little more generally about this idea of science and human rights. This was first enumerated as a human right, the human right to science in Article 27 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948, which said that everyone has the right to share in scientific achievement and its benefits. It was further elaborated in 1966 in an international covenant on economic, social, and cultural rights, which obliges states to respect the freedom indispensable for scientific research and to take necessary steps for the conservation, development, and diffusion of science. One year ago, the United Nations Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights published a document which provides further guidance on this right and describes ways of measuring and monitoring the implementation of the right to science. In particular, 
This document says that scientific progress and its applications should be accessible for all persons without discrimination. This access is not only to the fruits of science, but also to participation in science. The document speaks of three benefits of science. The material results of applications of scientific discoveries, the science knowledge and information itself, and interesting the role that science plays in forming a critical and responsible group of citizens. It also asserts that states should prioritize scientific and technological innovations that serve especially the needs of persons living in poverty and ensure that these people have access to the technological innovations. We're actually seeing now a major test of these ideals with respect to the worldwide access to vaccines during this COVID-19 pandemic. But scientific progress also brings new challenges and new human rights questions. I'm proud to say that contrary to what we see in many science fiction movies, scientists are often among the most vocal in calling attention to the human rights and ethical issues arising out of new discoveries and technology. Take, for example, the Union of Concerned Scientists on Atomic Weapons, the Nobel laureate Jennifer Doudna on gene editing, and the many computer scientists on the implications for personal security and privacy that arise from digital technologies. Most recently, my colleague Rafa Yusti here at Columbia University with Sarah Goring and others has urged the world to consider how human rights may have to be expanded in the face of advances in our knowledge of the neurosciences. One Rafa has enumerated five new rights, which he calls neuro rights. These are the rights to personal identity, free will, mental privacy, equal access to mental augmentation, and to the protection of, uh, from algorithmic bias. I want to end by pointing out a, uh, something from a book I, I recently read, which I liked very much, a novel, The Ministry for the Future by the science fiction author Kim Stanley Robinson. In it, he reiterates rights described in the 1966 International Covenant, describes these rights as the seven public necessities that are human rights, specifically the rights to food, water, clothing, shelter, electricity, health care, and education. Science and technology hold enormous promise to help ensure that these rights are enjoyed by all and to make the world more equitable. But we must make sure that all are given these rights. And because science and technology touch all aspects of our lives, I hope that the scientific and human rights communities can continue to collaborate and even do so more in the future to determine how best to implement these rights and how to expand human rights in the face of new scientific developments. Thank you. Thank you, Marty, so much. That was fantastic. Science as a human right is such a, an important thing to be talking about, especially right now. I want to get our provocateurs in on this because I'm sure they have some questions. We have seven minutes for a provocateur conversation. So who wants to go first? Uh, is it Connie Gottwald or Ginger? Welcome. Please feel free to either raise a hand or shout something out and ask Martian about science is a human right. Connie, please go for it. I'll go ahead. Thank you so much, Marty. Fascinating talk. Thank you so much. I, as you were speaking, the thought occurred to me that while science should indeed be a human right and the benefits of science should be a human right, I wondered if sometimes the advancement of science goes against some of the rights of, of, of people, some of the human rights or threatens the human rights of people what would you say to that i'm uh, i'm good calling question. i'm calling in from Kapal. good question is can science education be a danger can science as a human right be a danger to the humans they they are supposed to help so people can use all sorts of things inappropriately against other people there's no question about that i don't think there's anything specific to science to that, that I don't think that science is inherently an evil thing or something that goes against human rights. It's certainly something that people can use against it. And this is why we need laws and a respect for human rights and, and uh, uh, how uh, 
science is used. But the knowledge itself, I don't believe, is intrinsically something that is uh, uh, dangerous. It's how people mm. use things. But it's Absolutely. how they use anything. You can use yeah. a brick to build a building or you can use a brick to hit somebody. So it's a fantastic it's point. The brick. And yeah. well, Ginger. Let's get you guys in the conversation as yeah, well. Uh, Ginger, Ginger. I saw Ginger's hand yeah, up uh, first. Go, right? ahead, go, first. Uh, sure, go, go ahead, go ahead, Ginger. <laughs> go ahead, Ginger, please. So so, so Marty, you were mentioning specifically human rights in relation to the COVID vaccine or even water. And we're seeing what's happening in India right now with the devastation. We saw what happened in tribal communities in America. How do we implement human rights into that when you see the poorest communities getting decimated by things like this? So this uh, general comment that was made uh, in the UN uh, a year ago actually goes into many of these questions and it tries to address this specifically saying that governments should look at their laws to eliminate for example any law policy or practice prejudice or stereotype that undermines right on thank you everyone for staying with us we had a bit of a technical difficulty we are in a bandwidth world and bandwidth is a hot commodity so uh we're going to go back to our provocateurs and Marty Chalfi. We are talking about science is a human right. We're having a conversation with our provocateurs and Marty. I think we have four minutes back on the clock and we were talking, Ginger had a question and she was referencing what was going on in India and um, science is a human right. So Ginger, if you could please repeat your question and then we can have Marty answer. Amazing. Uh, Marty, thank you for the amazing talk. Uh, my question is kind of seeing what's going on right now in India with the devastation uh, without the vaccine, what we saw going on in the tribal nations in the US. How how do we implement human rights into sciences when so many of these communities are just getting decimated by, by these things? I th so the thing is that everyone has to speak out for this. I think that's it's the participation of everybody ensuring that everyone gets these rights that's important it's it's when people are being denied this this document that i said was issued a year ago by the un talking about how to implement the right to science uh, actually implores countries to look at their laws to make sure that they are not biased in particular ways that people are being neglected that and and i think we have to think internationally about how we're all in this together every country in the world got this virus we are all uh, one uh, one world in, in this unfortunate situation and i think we have to really work hard and and advocate for a global response to this. We are on Gatwall. Gatwall, you had a question for Marty. Uh, Marty and Gatwall, continue. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Mike, Marty, for the incredible talk. And uh, my name is Gatwall again. I'm from Uganda, RG. And uh, you talk about, you know, uh, science as a human right. And my question is, uh, what do we do? What What do we need to do? or the world to do more or less to ensure that, you know, there is uh, equal access to education, you know, for the future scientists, including those who are in the refugee camps or, or those who are in other countries who, who don't have access to quality education to become future scientists. Yes, great question. Education. It, it, is, a, it, it is a wonderful thing. Uh, and there's so many different aspects to it. One is being able to have access to scientific information. Mm. Because if you can't, if you need to be at a, in an, uh, a, a very rich country, at a very rich university to be able to get access to scientific papers, that really restricts things. So there's been a, a, a really big movement in the sciences. Physicists did this 25 years ago, the computer scientists did this, of being able to have uh, their manuscripts available to the entire world, irrespective of anything, before publication. 
and you have to evaluate them, but they make them available. In the last five or so years in the biological sciences, this has really exploded as a way of doing things. So one is having access to scientific information. That's that's really important. But you're really address, uh, bringing up a, a, a very important thing, and that is equal access to education. And this is particularly uh, challenging for the 68 million people that are displaced, either internally displaced because of conflicts in their own country or uh, refugees having left one country and gone to another for all sorts of reasons, and being able to provide them with access to this. And it's a massive problem, and it's one that should be addressed, I think, primarily because there is a lot of goodwill buy resources to do this. And I know that there's been a, a lot of attempts to try to do that. But I can also say that my experience in a lab is has shown me that if you only have one person with an idea, things don't progress. And if you have multiple perspectives, things progress really rapidly and very different perspectives. And I, to me, I've always taken this as the main argument. If you want science to progress, you have to have a diversity of interests and perspectives to do this. And that means bringing everybody in, not restricting any groups at all. How would you elicit that conversation across the globe? right? Because not everybody speaks the same language. So how would you elicit the conversation for those ideas to go back and forth between people as um, using science as a human right, as the umbrella? So, it, I mean, that, it, it's, it's difficult. I, often people say that I can't shut up. So I think I really like to talk to people about science and, and this. So I, I I, I, I sort of welcome uh, the opportunities to talk with people. I think that it is an obligation of scientists and in, in the country, in, in anywhere in the world, to really speak up about what the importance of science is in their communities, as well as other people too. I think we we need to have people speaking up. It's not that I'm doing my own little work and I'm in my room and I don't want to be bothered. It's I have to be bothered because this affects everyone. So I think it's a, it's a matter of participation. Thank you so much, Marty. Thank you, Connie. Thank you, Gottwell. Thank you, Ginger. Fantastic start, although bumpy incredibly informative and really entertaining. I appreciate you all. Thank you so much.